Hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Average Joes. We've been gone a while, but I'm glad we're back. I'm Joseph St. John, and I'm retired law enforcement. And we have a very special episode this week. So I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Robert Baker, and I'll let him tell you the rest. All right. I'm Robert Baker. I'm an attorney, practicing attorney in Michigan. Um, we have today a, a meeting that was held in, a, in front of the Oakland County Bar Association, which is part of Detroit proper. Um, the gentleman's name is Kevin King. Kevin King had done 40 years in, in the uh, Michigan prison system for a couple of murders that he uh, didn't commit, but um, the Supreme Court changed the laws and made uh, it where it's unconstitutional to have juvenile uh, offenders or up to 18, I think they're going to move it up to 21, be in prison for life without parole. Um, they changed it, and Kevin is one of the first. If he's not the first, he's the second person to get out based on that new Supreme Court ruling. And um, he's going to be talking to the uh, the Oakland County Bar Association about the prison system, his uh, experiences with it, and um, the reforms that he's proposing and how he achieved his freedom. And this is one of many we're going to do on prison reform, and we're going to get back going. I don't want to give you a, a, what we'll call a schedule, but we're going to be back. We're going to be staying on it, so that's good. Robert, I think that um, your entire law firm should be thanked about this, all of your staff. Um, Crystal, everybody in there really needs to be thanked about everything that they've done, and thank you for making it happen for Kevin. Appreciate that. We have been on a hiatus. We have, this is just the beginning, hopefully of many more to come. We have, we're working on a episode for Charles Manson. We have a, hopefully a surprise guest that we're working on getting, which will put the, the final, the polish on our 16 episodes of the Michigan murder cases that we had done. Um, was it last year? Or is it? Yeah. yeah, last, it was last, year. yeah last year. And um, we're working hard and diligently on that. We've had a series of unfortunate incidents between us, which we're not going to go into, but we're working through all of that. But we're so, back. But enjoy the episode. Comment below, like, smash the like button if you can, if you like it. Um, we have in our uh, absence, evidently our followership has almost tripled and our, <laughs> and our uh, uh, How are people watching our videos when we stop making them? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's where you have to go away. I don't know. But anyway, so uh, enjoy the episode. Uh, look look for, forward to more to come. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back soon. Thanks a lot. Hey. Good evening. I want to thank everyone for being here. My name is Kevin thank King. You. At the age of 18 in 1982, I was sentenced to serve life without parole for first degree murder. After serving almost 41 years within the Michigan Department of Corrections, on December 8th of 2022, I was released from custody. Many that are attending are questioning how someone sentenced to prison without uh, life without parole could be standing before you. On July 28th, our Michigan Supreme Court made a ruling in People versus Parks that it was cruel and unusual punishment for a juvenile sentenced to life without parole. And two 18 year olds are juveniles. The ruling was based on Dr. Steinberg's brain development science, which concluded that there are indistinguishable brain developments uh, between eight, 17 and 18 year olds. In a nutshell, 18 year olds are just kids. And as an evolving society, we cannot throw away kids just because of a lack of maturity and an inability to make rational choices. Unless it can be proven that juveniles are irredeemable and it can be proven that they are not rehabilitative, that individual cannot be sentenced to life without parole. Um, prosecutors can use the statute in an institutional record to seek um, a reinstatement of life without parole, but they have a high hurdle to accomplish it. Karen McDonald, David Williams and Marilyn Day of the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office have shown extreme compassion with the evolving standards of the law. 
safety to the community and bringing about change to the throwaway, the key mentality that plagued our judicial system for decades. Each and every one of these individuals should be applauded for the integrity they have brought to their office and to our judicial system and to our communities. Judges, lawyers, and prosecutors who are confident in our laws should also be confident in its mercy. Strictness and compassion with applications of our laws must evenly be applied. I don't have a personal ax to grind against the Michigan Department of Corrections, but being confined within the Michigan Department of Corrections for nearly 41 years has given me a unique perspective. First, let me emphasize that within the Michigan Department of Corrections are profoundly spectacular people that do their jobs ineffably. Many wrote letters seeking my release. Today, they are friends. However, in its entirety, the Michigan Department of Corrections has and continues to fail us as a society. It is an entity that operates without oversight. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Philosopher Dostobius said, the degree of a civilization can be judged by entering this prison system. Who amongst you really knows what goes on behind prison gates? It is promised the truth would appall you. The Department of Corrections disseminates the narrative that they are trying to sell. It is strongly encouraged that each of you search out the facts of what is, has, and continues to transpire behind our prison walls. But you better have a strong stomach because it is sickening. In Neal versus MDOC, it was proven that prison guards were raping female prisoners by the hundreds. The Department of Corrections settled that case for $100 million. A few years later, in John Doe versus MDOC, it was proven that juvenile offenders were raped by older prisoners, hundreds of prisoners. The department settled that case for $80 million. Today, older prisoners are being subjected to assaults, rapes, robberies by younger prisoners. Drugs and gang activity are higher than ever before in our prison system. Trust me, I've been there to see it for over decades. Nothing is being done about the digression of our prison system. One would think that with the MDOC knowing what is happening, they would immediately separate the older population. The next suit is coming and will once again be settled and swept underneath the rug. Yes, our prison system has digressed. The system has gotten worse over the decades. Since the early 1990s, our prison system has become nothing more than a $2 billion warehousing system. Almost one out of every five tax dollars goes to our prisons. Keith Barber is our legislative ombudsman. He is an exceptional individual and it is encouraged that each and every one of you search out the facts through his office. He has a plethora of information to provide you. According to the MDOC statistics, the average education level for someone incarcerated is the fifth grade. Our recidivism rates are shameful and a reflection of our failing system. The numbers are manipulated based on the policies put forth by the MDOC. The zero, uh, zero tolerance policy brought a, forth a higher recidivism rate. The relaxation of those policies dropped the recidivism numbers. Should any prisoner be released from the MDOC nothing, knowing nothing about the technological advancements of society today? Cell phones, computers, and other technological advancements, pumping gas, automated checkouts, paying bills online or general banking. My biggest adjustment with reintegration back into society was being subjected to this technological advancement. Remember, I had seen nothing since the 1980s. My wife, Cheryl King, 
Attorney Robert Baker and Christine Gones, Crystal Gones, have literally held my hand and introduced me to the mind-boggling advancements of today. Robert bought and sent me a laptop for remote employment. We'll talk more about Robert in a second. Days passed like they were seconds. Weeks seemed like hours and months like days. I was being engulfed by today's society, by the world. Cultural shock would be an understatement. My wife, Robert and Crystal have been there every step of the way. My heart goes out to those that don't have a support group as strong and as great as mine. On March 6, 2023, I had to stand before the Honorable Kwame Rowe for resentencing. Trepidation shook me to the core. Attached to my motion for resentencing were supportive of letters from lawyers, judges, and DOC employees, a retired FBI agent, and other prominent members of our society. But fear ran through my veins, the thought of being locked up again, even for an hour. My attorney, Robert Baker, spoke. The people concurred and the judge resentenced me to 40 to 60 years. The judge's voice gripped every part of me. He said, Mr. King, I've read the documents with this case and I'm impressed with your accomplishments. You have a second chance at life and I wish you luck. Wow, that was quick. Because of the good time credits and the disciplinary, disciplinary credits by, uh, afforded underneath the statute, I served almost five years over any sentence that they can impose. I was completely free. I walked out of the courtroom and stopped and inhaled freedom. I wanted to re-enter the courtroom and speak and thank the judge, shake his hand, and perhaps give him a hug. To this day, I hear the judge's tone and voice. I wanted to thank and speak to the prosecutors and assure them I was more than another file on their desk. Representative Iash explained that we need to recognize the gravity of putting someone in prison. U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Kennedy once said, we should not hang a sign above our prison doors that says enter here and abandon all hope. If we as a society cannot confidently release prisoners that have served 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we are screaming that our system has failed. How can we and why do we confidently release people that have served one tenth of that time on other crimes? The previous director of the Michigan Department of Corrections, Patricia Caruso, once said, we need to distinguish who we are mad at and who we fear. Every statistical report from any university or government agency, no matter where you look, indicates that offenders age out of crime. The recidivism rate for lifers or long indeterminate sentences is under 1%. Yet those are the people that we do not release or look at releasing from the prison system. I could walk through our prison system and pick dozens of prisoners we could release. Stipulated on the fact that if they reoffend, I too would be locked up. We need to get away from this lock them up and throw away the key mentality. It is not working. We are destroying lives and communities. In 1998-99, a desire to study our sentencing system began that it was be collected and assessments made available to restructure our sentencing. The project was abandoned. Why? Far above my pay grade or comprehension. But as a civilized society, we need to, a comprehensive prison reform. Representative Iash has introduced House Bill 4173, which would create a criminal justice policy commission in the in the Legislative Council. The 19 member board task would be to collect information and 
pass it on to com communities, prosecutors, and other things. Restructuring our prison system and sentencing. Why would anybody not support that? While incarcerated, I tried to restructure my life. In the 1980s and 1990s, I studied the law, focusing on civil litigation so I could fight the injustices within the Michigan Department of Corrections. At the time, 35 years ago, I had not seen a light at the end of the tunnel, but I refused to become a product of my environment. Over the decades, I read books that were associated with human behavior in the inside operations of our prison system. Like basketball or football, you have to know the rules of the game to comprehend what's happening on the field, or you're oblivious to what's happening before you. The rules of the game in your profession, you must know all the rules of the game, or you're unable to make solid calls when you're not fully appraised. The only way to be fully appraised is to know and understand both sides of the coin. Books, the law, and support of people kept my head kept, a, kept my head above water. The drug epidemic in our prison system is the worst I've ever seen. It's unimaginable. In the decades of exposure, it has only gotten worse. Gangs are manipulating the operation of our phones, extorting people, and operating with impunity within our prison walls. Why would our system digress? Can anyone explain how throwing someone into this madness is rehabilitative and helps makes our community safer? A book that will enlighten you as to the human behavior, criminal and political, is entitled The Lucifer Effect, written by Professor Philip Zambardo. Um, many might recall that he did a study in Stanford University in the 1970s entitled The Prison Project. He carried on his studies over decades and wrote the book. Personally, I feel everyone in our judicial system should read the book and grasp why people act the way they do. A book that was banned by the Michigan Department of Corrections until sued for their illegal activity of restricting the book is entitled The Selling of America, C-E-L-L-I-N-G, by Burton Rose, Pens and Wright. You can get the book from Prison Legal News. The book addresses the malfeasance within our pr countrywide prison system. After reading the book, I became angry because it documented what is happening inside the prison walls, yet nothing was being done to correct it. With people being raped, extorted, ODing, and being killed, I struggled to keep normalcy in my life. While maneuvering the confines of incarceration, I hung, to, hung on to and cherished relationships I cultivated over the years. My wife and friendships kept me normal per se. Attorney Gregory Longworth from Clark and Hill was appointed as counsel on one of the many cases that I filed against the MDOC. While I did not want counsel, over the years, we built a friendship. I called on him and he called on me. Robert Baker, an attorney out of Allegan, Michigan, the story behind Robert and I. Approximately 15 years ago, one of Robert's employees was on vacation and a brief was coming up on the due date. The employee was a friend of mine and knew of my ability and success in filing briefs. He told Robert to mail the documents to me and I would respond. Robert exclaimed that it was a prisoner. Robert was impressed with the response brief that I prepared and he decided to visit. Over the years, Robert reached out to me for analyzing and responding to various pleadings. A trust and a friendship developed. It is uh, strongly encouraged that everyone in attendance let's listen to the podcast to Average Joe's. Robert and retired Sheriff Joe St. John out of Missouri addressed the systemic breakdown in our judicial system, an enlightening podcast. Let me speak about my release from custody. On December 8th, 
2022. My life took a twist that I never really was prepared for. While I fought for release, hoped for release, and prayed for it, I was never really prepared for it. I was called to the desk within the prison system and told to pack my property. I was being released. I went from doing a life sentence to being released in an hour. I gave all my belongings to other prisoners that were in need of stuff. And I walked to the front gate area. I was directed that I had to report to healthcare, to which I refused. I was too close to that gate. <laughs> I didn't want to back away from it or take a chance that anything would transpire in the minutes that were before me. A lady from the MDOC records department read numerous documents to me and asked me to sign certain pages. Honestly, I have no idea what she read and I have no idea what I signed. As the gates opened, my wife cried and jumped up and down, frantically trying to get to me. She grabbed a hold of me and hugged me. My mind switched to prison rules and I assessed if her actions violated the rule. Even though I walked out the prison gates, prison was on my shirt tail. It will always be on my shirt tail. My wife and I jumped in the car. I grabbed a hold of my seat and complained that she was driving too fast. We were still in the parking lot. She was driving five miles an hour. I was unable to look out the front windshield because everything was coming at me too fast. I wanted to call people. Robert Baker, Crystal Gomes, Judge Joseph Farah, Greg Willie Longforth, Keith Barber, those intringent in my endeavors for release. My wife was laughing at me because I was amazed and confused by the cell phone. It was coming over the speakers of the car. Who would have thought? Robert Baker hired me immediately as a paralegal in his firm. Keith Barber's reaction was priceless. He asked me if I was serious about being released. I called retired MDOC personnel and thanked them. I helped dozens of prisoners file claims against the MDOC for multiple reasons, conditions of confinement, and lack of medical care. Many of those cases matured to appointment of counsel. I worked with dozens of attorneys answering questions and assuring factual information in those cases were presented. One case was coming up fast for trial, but I was released from prison. So I reached out to attorney Carrie McCollian as she was appointed counsel on a case I helped file for a prisoner and I was the key witness. Attorney Malconian spoke to me almost every night preparing her client's case for trial. Little did Carrie know she was injecting normalcy into my life. After I fought the department for decades, I was in my comfort zone. At her request, I drove down to the federal building and testified. I felt I had an obligation to do so. The jury returned a favorable verdict. Carrie did a marvelous job on the case. The FBI hires consultants that are former felons on security issues. Casinos hire former card sharks and cheats as consultants. After all, who knows the facts better than those that were part of those facts? The governor should hire a consultant for the MDOC issues a person that cannot be fired or discarded because of they openly oppose to the issues at hand, a consultant that openly and professionally can oppose the system and document true facts. Where is the consultant for the MDOC? Where is the consultant for the governor? We need a sort of people in places that matter. And being exposed to politics, I've learned that party divides stagnate our advancements. Why would a person totally reject an idea because 
it was introduced by the opposing party member. Why is this accepted? In any other segment of life, this would not be tolerated. Do we reject an idea because it derived from a black man, a white man, or a Jewish man? For unexplainable reasons, this has become acceptable in our political arena. And all this ties into the application of our laws and the breakdown of our judicial system. Ladies and gentlemen, our system is broken and you can fix it by not turning a blind eye, by fully understanding all the aspects and ramifications of your job. Now, what I tell you or someone else tells you doesn't matter. It's obtaining the factual information, but you have to search out that information because it's out there. I wanna thank my wife for all her support, unwavering. Stephanie, Fakai, Carrie, McConian, remarkable ladies, Robert Baker, Crystal Gones, your colleagues and friends, Karen McDonald and staff, Judge Rowe, Keith Barber, all remarkable people. Should anyone want true consulting, please contact Stephanie for my contact information. I am a tax paying citizen, a voter and always free. Thank you to all and be mindful and joyous. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Very powerful and very much appreciated. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the motion that you filed. So you and I were talking a little bit before the meeting officially started and you were mentioning the fact that after these decisions came down from the Michigan Supreme Court, you had spoken to some attorneys and you were interested in, in filing a motion for resentencing, but you were told that the law was not gonna be retroactive and, and basically you shouldn't waste your time. So if you can just kind of talk a little bit about that and then what steps you took to actually make this happen. Well, when the, the parks came out and the pool case came out, it was attorneys were juggling back and forth and I reached out to them because I'm not an attorney, but I have a good comprehension of the law. Um, and I read it probably a dozen times. And I sat down and I talked to my wife, um, who she said to me, if I'm confident in knowing what I'm doing on that issue, then file it. Um, I reached out to Robert Baker um, because we built a report and I didn't want to go in pro per. Um, so I drafted up the motion and sent it to him and Crystal Gones, she works in the office, bless her heart. She, um, she was reading the stuff that I submitted and she went to restructuring things because an attorney that represents himself has a fool for a client because you're too emotionally attached. Um, even though that we talked back and forth, um, Robert's office, me, Crystal, probably a dozen times. Um, and my wife was reaching out to attorneys and she was talking to attorneys and they were telling her, no, 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 no. And she brushed them off. She's going to listen to what I say. Um, Sato. Yeah, even Sato was. Uh, so she was um, very supportive in what I did. So we filed the motion with some changes on it because I was too emotionally attached. Um, and surprisingly, at first we received opposition verbally from the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. But after reading the brief, they concurred. It was mind boggling. Um, they concurred with the resentencing and the bond, um, released me on bond. And that's when I was released on December 8th of 2022. Um, so, and then because it was a proven success, other attorneys have reached out to Robert's office now for guidance and stuff. So Crystal and Robert have done an amazing job. Um, you know, and thank you to many people that I'm sitting where I'm sitting. Um, it's a combination of 
so many attorneys and so many judges and so many people in my life and that I feel blessed because I had a, a friendship and a rapport with these people. Um, I mean, I called them after hours. I, um, I called them during hours. I, so it's a conglomerate of everybody. It's, it, it's a success story to our judicial system. Well, and I mean, really a, a testament to you and your perseverance and, you know, like you said, you read the case, you had your, you know, law legal experience from serving time in MDOC. And I really think that that speaks volumes that even though you had, you know, very reputable attorneys telling you this isn't going to apply, you thought that it would. And sure enough, you were right. Oh, yes. And, um, you know, I, for Karen McDonald, David Williams out of the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office, um, they looked at things objectively, obviously. Um, Judge Rowe, geez, amazing. Um, I stood in front of him and it was funny because I have, when I'm, when somebody says something to me and I don't agree, I speak my mind. Um, and my, Robert told me like three times, shut up, don't say anything. Shut up, don't say anything. So, you know, things went good. That's good. So I'll open it up now. If any um, committee members that are on the Zoom have a question, I asked Kevin beforehand and he was gracious enough to say that he, he welcomes any questions that anybody might have about his experience and what he did. And otherwise, if not, I'll say, oh yes, go ahead, please, Paul. So, Kevin, I guess I got to uh, just uh, can you explain legally how it was that you were able to argue that those uh, Supreme Court cases were ready, how they would have applied to you? Because I would say well, that I would say the same thing a lot of those lawyers said. And I'm just wondering if it's the prosecutor's office that decided to simply concede because you had a, a, a compelling reason that you should be released as opposed to legally conceding that, that it was retroactive? Um, well, there was, it's, it's the same thing that came down from um, the Miller case out of the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, they can't say that something is unconstitutional in my mind. They couldn't say that something was unconstitutional to 18 year olds and start it today because what about the people that are stuck in the system? Well, the same applications applied from the United States Supreme Court in uh, the Miller case. Mm -hmm. And they argued back and forth about the retroactivity in that case. And the court said the exact same thing that I just said, you can't um, apply it starting today and say that it doesn't affect those that are stuck in the system. So I was very, and because I read the Miller case and the Montgomery and all that, um, I was applying that thought process to the pool and parks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually, it's a good point. Makes sense. And um, Kevin was sharing with me also that he's currently, well, I guess first I'll ask, are you aware of anybody else who's um, been able to have the cases applied to, to their um, um, retroactively? Yeah, it's, there's, there's a person that's, uh, in fact, two people out of Oakland County are scheduled to be resentenced. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's not as much as I want to say that it was my institutional record because I had an exemplary institutional record. Um, and that is part of the law. I think it's 769.25 six uh, that is addressing the institutional records and mine was impeccable um but and i don't want to put the other person's name out there because of that i'm afraid of the adversity his institutional record is not all that um kosher so but he's being resentenced he's scheduled for resentencing um there's there it, it, it i would Oakland County seems to be embracing the evolving changing of our laws, and I commend them for that. While other counties like Detroit, they're emphatically fighting it, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and I believe that what's gonna happen is it's gonna 
a lot of people are going to sit here for two, three, four more years while this is litigated up to the, the courts. And that's a long time. Um, you know, Stephanie, you yourself said that when you went into the prison system for a couple hours. Um, wow. I, the, the prison system is just so brutal um, physically, psychologically. Um, there is nobody that walks out, of, and I mean this wholeheartedly, there's nobody that walks out of, our, out of our prison system better off than when they went in. Um, unfortunately, it builds a distrust in our system because we're exposed to, like I talked about the Neil case, um, and I talked about John Doe versus MDOC. This is stuff that we see and we live with every day in the confines of our prison system. And I, the closest I can associate this with, and I apologize because I'm not a veteran, um, but our military personnel that are in the battlefield fighting every day for survival is the same thing as fighting for survival in our prison system. And if anybody can enlighten me how this is better as a person's reintegration back into society, and, and I have to say that 98% of the people, according to statistics from our prison system, are going to get released. So how is this helping them out? If you're stagnating a person in their growth um, to technological advancements, I mean, the computers, um, the cell phones, um, you're putting a person at a deficit, not only for the psychological stuff that's going on, um, but our society is, you know, the people in prison are not prepared for, look at our technological advancements in a couple of years. Um, your cell phones, your computers are all updated. Um, it becomes antiquated to you, but a person has to learn everything that you discarded in those years. It's, it's just, it, the best way to describe it is cultural shock. It's, and it's an understatement. Um, we learn to distrust the system. Uh, and uh, again, this doesn't apply across the board. Um, and I don't intend it to. Um, but the majority of the MDOC guards are very abusive. Um, they lie, cheat, connive. I could give you transcripts of cases that I've proved that they've lied. They've gotten up on the stand and lied because they think within their realm, they can do whatever they want. They're gods. And basically they can um, until you take them to another realm and then the courtroom, then it's a whole change of the spectrum. Um, but it, it's horrible. It's a really horrible experience. And, and that was actually how you were connected with Carrie because she was suing MDOC on behalf of somebody who was incarcerated. And because you were so um, intimately familiar with the policies of MDOC, you were able to assist her. Well, in that correct. Um, her client, I filed his claim form. I filed his complaint. I filed his briefs all the way up to summary judgment. And when he beat all that. Um, and if you don't mind hearing what, what the basis of his complaint was. Um, it was a retaliation. Um, the officer, it was uh, Seymour, case Seymour versus Farmer, S-E-Y-M-O-R-E, -E, Farmer. Um, he got into an argument with an officer and the officer said that he threatened him and he threw him in segregation right before Christmas. And he sat and said, now we're going to get into a whole nother topic about isolation. Um, but anyways, he threw him in there. Um, the hearing officer for the MDOC, which is independent, isn't part of the MDOC, looked at the video and found out that he wasn't even anywhere in the vicinity. So they found out that he lied, and but he was filing a complaint against that officer. So the officer retaliated. So anyway, it was such an abusive case, and Kerry did such a marvelous job on that, that the jury awarded $183,000. That's a, a pretty staggering amount for a prisoner claim. Um, but that's not, these aren't isolated cases. The, the, because, and I spoke on that, the average education level for somebody incarcerated is the fifth grade. They don't know how to maneuver around the grievances, the policies, 
the laws. So it places them at a disadvantage while it put me up on the hierarchy because I was the person to where probably in the Department of Corrections must be glad to get rid of me because I was responsible for probably 80% of the cases filed. And most of those cases have been very successful. Um, because one thing with the law, if you present the truth, they can't get away with it. So. And so how did you become more familiar with the policies? Because I think that's something that, you know, all attorneys, especially criminal defense attorneys, well, benefit from. The, the thing with the, the Department of Corrections was, and there, this was years ago and decades ago, there was a prisoner that told me that you have to know the rules of the game to understand what's going on around you. Um, and it was a very different system, even though it was very brutal in the 80s and the 90s. Um, there was more respect, more teaching, more um, support. Prisoners stuck together more. And there, it was common to have people learning the policies and the laws back then. But as the decades progressed, they died off. They went home. And the newer generation that was coming in or the younger generation that was coming in didn't want to learn. They just wanted to do drugs and focus on other things. Um, so, but the Department of Corrections is under the philosophy and they, they're very smart in the way they do this, um, that if they can keep the prisoners fighting amongst each other, mm -hmm. then nobody's focusing on what they're doing. Um, nobody from the Attorney General's office or the Michigan Department of Corrections can ever tell you. Um, and I have, in fact, if you read King versus Amara, they talk about that in there. Um, they can't say that I've ever done anything wrong. Um, they didn't like, they don't like anybody that can think that's higher than a fifth grade education. Um, I encourage every lawyer, every prosecutor, every judge to do a deep dive and get information on the Department of Corrections um, because it will come, we need our prison systems. There's people in there that I wouldn't want to be my neighbor. Um, and I know some of the serious people in the system but our system needs to be restructured because it's failing us. Um, it's failing those confined and it's failing us as a society. Um, because who really knows what goes on? You've gone into visiting rooms and other attorneys going to, but that's a very isolated area. Who really knows what goes on behind the prison walls? The policy in the Department of Corrections employee disciplinary policy is 02031000. And if you read that policy, it's shocking because if you, if a guard assaults you after arbitration, he can get three days off. But if you talk back to the warden, it's automatic dismissal. Explain to me the logic there. Um, but, and look at the Neil case, Neil versus MDOC and John Doe versus MDOC and read those cases and this is what's going on behind our prison walls every day. I mean, you're talking these cases, hundreds of prisoners, sometimes thousands of prisoners, but it's happening and it's documented. Nobody's really looking at this and nobody's really calling for prison reform. There's years ago, um, our legislative ad ombudsman was um, really sinking his teeth in the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections is very powerful because of their budget and their lobbying. And they closed down the legislative ombudsman's office. It stayed closed for years. And Keith Barber, when they reopened, he took over as legislative ombudsman. Remarkable man, a remarkable man. And I would just say that any attorney, anybody wants any factual information, statistics, anything, reach out to him and get it. He has a plethora of information. He's a straight shooter. He's going to give it to you the way it is. Learn from it. You can, everybody here can change the system. Um, not just defense attorneys, judges, prosecutors, representatives. Um, but they really need to look and say, the first question is, is our system working or is it failing? If everybody comes to that conclusion that it's failing, what are they going to do to reform it? Because it needs reforming. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll <laughs> open the floor one last time if anybody has any follow-up questions 
And well, oh yes, please, Robert, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. King, thank you again for uh, being available for us and sharing your story. I was particularly interested in hearing about um, your experience because I actually have just very recently filed a, a motion uh, in Wayne County. And I think you uh, briefly touched on this, but in your experience and particularly with consulting with others, do you find Oakland County being an outlier in terms of how they reacted or responded? Um, I think you briefly mentioned that Detroit was more reluctant or apprehensive. Unfortunately, that's where my motion is filed. So if perhaps you have any insight and you know suggestions uh, for dealing with that, I know obviously that was quite different than your experience, but uh, would be very curious to hear. Um, I, you know, I can't speak for the mindset of the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. All I can say is that they, at first it was strongly opposed. Absolutely not. But it was verbally, <coughs> excuse me, when it came down to writing, mind, you would not believe if I told you it was just, we concur. Um, bond we concur um but it seems that oakland county is doing this with multiple in people um i cannot i would have to say that because of the uh wayne county prosecutor that everything's being stagnated from what i see on that realm um I on, that macomb county had one so far yeah, Macomb County uh, resentenced one person so far, um, but they also tried to seek uh, life without parole for another pe person. Um, and some of these people deserve um, resentencing to life without parole, um, but a very small number, a very small number. And I think that those people, I think that our people are smart enough to weed out who is and who isn't. Um, I wish I could answer your question fully about Wayne County. I would be more willing. You can get a hold of Stephanie. She can give you my contact information. I would let you read and forward to you, <coughs> excuse me, everything we filed and help you in any way possible. Um, yeah, I was actually going to ask Kevin, if you wouldn't mind sharing the motion that you filed, I think that would be uh, very beneficial for our membership to, to have the opportunity to see that pleading. Yes, I uh, I could do that. I can't do it right now, but sure, I mean, no, of course. Yeah. my computer's in use. You have to remember, I'm not too technological advanced, so <laughs> I can't do multiple tasks at one time. I'm afraid to answer different telephone calls. Um, yes, it's, um, yeah, I will share it with whoever, you know, in fact, Stephanie, if you would like it, I will give you a yeah, copy. If you, you just email it, it how you want to. Yes, you can just email it to me and then I can go ahead and share it with the um, entire committee. So then everybody- yes, will within uh, the there. next day or so, I will get that to you. That's yeah. absolutely- okay. Kevin, thank I have you, a Mr. quick King. question <laughs> and I, I thank you for, for sharing with us. Um, and before the question, maybe a response to you, Robert, as far as it, a lot of it has to do with, because it is so subjective, timing, and who you're dealing with, what judge you have, because if he had had a different judge in Oakland County, his, his results, even with the prosecutor concurring, could have been drastically different. Um, yes. And it depends on the administration, because if you had brought this eight or nine years ago in Oakland County, I assure you, it, you would not have had the same results. Yeah, so I a lot concur. of that has to do with that. And my question to you, uh, Kevin, is since you had mentioned you thought it was about maybe that you brought like 80% of the, uh, the cases out of the prison. So who stepped up? Who's the new Kevin um, uh, in terms of what's going on now? That's a very interesting question. Um, there isn't. There isn't. I, I receive probably eight telephone calls. Uh, yeah, are you week. still are you still um, doing stuff to help the folks? Are you doing anything now that yes, you're out? Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And my wife gets mad. She gets mad. She's in the background saying, "You know," but I, I think she may have a right to because she probably wants to enjoy you now well, that you're out. I mean, she's been true. deprived. You've been deprived for four decades. That's that's a an enormous amount of time. So, um, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that it it depends on the judge and Kwame Rowe 
you know, I, um, I can still hear his voice and see his face. Um, remarkable man. Um, I think that it, like dominoes, it, it all lined up for me and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I would like to sit down and talk to David Williams and Karen, Karen McDonald and Marilyn Day and find out what their thought process is. I can't fill in the blanks for what they were thinking or why they did what they did. I would like to know. I would like to uh, be able to answer questions individually and be able to say with confidence and assurity that this is why it happened. Um, but I can't. Why? why things are happening in Oakland County right now is a blessing. You are absolutely correct. If this would have happened eight oh, years know. ago. Oh, I know. Yeah. Even, yeah. even I'll say this, even two years ago, before, oh, before yeah. Kwame was on the bench, because you oh, would yeah. have had Judge Bowman and Judge mm -hmm. Bowman. Oh, my. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I agree. Um, it, it's just, um, I am going to share, and I hope you find something in it. I tried to keep it very simple and very short. Um, it was probably six, seven pages long with exhibits, um, because I, I like to argue things where I don't leave what I call wiggle room. Um, but absolutely correct. In another courtroom, uh, another decade ago or years ago, it would have been different. Or that same courtroom. Yeah, right. You just sort of a different judge. Just a different and... black robe wear. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Absolutely correct. Kevin, well, congratulations to you. Yes. Well, I thank you. Say, yeah. Luckily, the, the circumstances worked in your favor. And I, I encourage people that if they need consulting or they want to know about the MDOC, Stephanie, I ask that they reach out to you and you give Absolutely. my contact information to them um, because I, I'm not going to bite my tongue. I will tell you what is. I will tell you what the laws, the policies, how they hide stuff. Carrie will tell you. I told her where they hide stuff. She found all the stuff. Um, but each and every attorney, prosecutor, and judge, they need to look at the system. Yeah, absolutely. And we have some uh, members that had to leave earlier, but they give their things in the chat and they thank you for sharing your story and they say that they were very grateful to hear and to be able to learn from you. So I really, I mean, Kevin, I, I just can't thank you enough for being so gracious, sharing your time, everything that you do on behalf of people who are at the mercy of the MDOC. And I believe that you may have some attorneys reaching out to you for some consultation. So hopefully you're up for that. Well, I am definitely up to that. And I want to thank everybody in attendance for taking the time to look, listen. Um, and please, the computer is marvelous. You can find anything you want out on the computer. Um, look at the MDOC and look at these cases. And um, Representative Ias said it best. We have, to, we have to look at the gravity of putting somebody in our prison system. And I'm not, I'm, you know, we need our prison system. Come but we don't look at the employee suits. Also. Yeah, the employees sue the Michigan Department of Corrections more than the prisoners. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> they really do. Wow. So, anyways, you know, I want to thank everybody emphatically. Um, Stephanie, I'm still holding you to coffee. <laughs> you got it. So, to everybody, please, I will make sure I give my copy, you know, the copy of the brief to you. Um, if you have any other questions, Robert uh, Baker out of Allegan, his office will answer any questions. Um, I wish everybody the best and may, may this echo in your minds for a while. Yes, it, it absolutely will. And I know that we all certainly share that sentiment and wish you the best as well, Kevin. <laughs> we will certainly be in touch. So.